Well, good morning, church. Good to see you in the house of the Lord today. Why don't we stand together all over this room? Aren't you thankful that the Lord woke us up this morning, gave us a brand new, beautiful day? This is a day that we can worship and celebrate our Creator. And so let's just begin this service just directing our hearts toward Him. Can we do that? Come on, all over this room, let's just begin in a word of prayer. Father, today we thank you for your presence. Lord, we thank you that your word declares you are here in our midst. That you inhabit the praises of your people. That you delight in our praises. God, our hearts desire in coming to your house this Sunday morning. Lord, even before the needs of our life, God, our motivation is who you are. Lord, you deserve the praise today. So, Lord, we give you our hearts. We give you these songs. Lord, we invite you to just come and to have your way in this place. Come and move today.
in a grace so relentless I am one by perfect love wrapped within the arms of heaven in a place that lasts forever sinking deep in mercy see how I wait drawing closer by grace and all my heart is yours oh fear removed bring you in lean into your love oh your love your love To me, I lift my head and see your glory, Lord of all. You're beautiful. Here in you, I find shelter, captivated by the splendor of your face. My secret place, I wide away, draw me close.
we want to know you more, more than ever before, Jesus. We draw near to us today, God. Lord, thank you that in your faithful love, Lord, your word declares that even when we're unfaithful, still you are faithful. It is who you are. You are a God who always shows up on time. Lord, forgive our frustration when our timing is out of alignment with your timing, but God, help us to see your faithfulness today when we call on you to come. believe 
just where we are. today we just stretch our faith toward heaven God give us faith to believe Lord beyond what circumstances would tell us give us faith like Martha who even though her brother had been in the grave for four days Lord when you showed up she said Jesus if you'd been here Things would have been different. If you'd been here, my brother would be alive. But then she said, but even now I know that you have the words of life. God, give us irrational faith today. Give us extravagant faith today that can stare death in the face and say, but even still I know that God is greater. But even now I know that you have the words of life. So Father, we bring our faith to you today. We bring the mountains of difficulties that we face today. And God, we thank you that that you're in control. God, that nothing is too difficult for you. Nothing is too difficult for you. So right now, God, we posture our faith toward heaven, and we believe today, God, that you are a miracle-working God. You are a miracle-working God. You are a come-through God. Lord, you show up and you show up right on time. So, Lord, today we just declare your faithfulness. We declare your goodness. Even now. today, but I want to just invite you to take about 25 seconds, and would you just begin to thank God for His faithfulness? Even if it seems like He hasn't come through yet, just know that He knows what you need. And He's moving toward you today. Come on, let's just give God praise. Lord, we thank you today. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you that, Lord, you, you never leave us or forsake us. Lord, all your promises are true. So, Lord, I believe, Lord, you are moving towards the hearts of your people, even now. So we give you praise, God. We give you praise, Lord, that your ear is not closed to us this morning. And your arm is not short. Lord, you are faithful to keep your promises, so we give you glory today. Come on, by faith, would you just declare what we sang earlier? Say, you are a miracle-working God.
that this morning. Just put your hands together for the Lord. He's worthy of praise. He's worthy of glory. He's still a miracle working God today. I'm Pastor Chris. I just want to welcome you to church this morning. And I don't know about you, but I can already just feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. You know, it says in Psalm 133, it says how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. There's something like fragrant about the people of God coming together. It's almost like God's like, oh, that's good. You know, that feeling? That's what he's doing right now in the heavenlies. We're pr our prayer this morning is that, that heaven would come to earth, that we would see his miracle working power. And maybe you're new here with us this morning. I just want to take a moment to just recognize you and just say, we're just so glad that you're here today. We really believe that we're better because you came in today. We really believe that. And uh, just to honor you, we actually have a gift that we have for you. And we have some connect cards that if you fill out one of those connect cards, turn it back into the info center. We just have something for you because we're honored that you take time, come in, be in the house of God with us. You chose a good place to be on a Sunday morning. I'll tell you that much. Why don't we all just take a moment? Maybe there's somebody here you haven't seen in a while or maybe you've never seen them. Let's just take a moment, say hello to somebody this morning, shake somebody's hand, and then you can have a seat. Wow, wow. Man, do you sense God's presence here today? Amen. Come on, if you don't sense God's presence here today, you need to climb up on the roof and fix your antenna. <laughs> Something's not right. Now, I'm so glad you're here. I just want to echo what Pastor Chris said and, and welcome you to God's house this morning. Uh, I, I have expectation in my heart that God wants to do something in this place. And some of you are just sensing already faith is, is building. I want to just encourage you with that thought today. Let me just go ahead and tell you right now, I'm preaching today about a miracle working God. So we wanted to get that song down in your spirit and to begin to build faith for what God wants to share with us uh, from the word today. Right now we're going to receive our morning tithe and offering. And uh, I just want to encourage you as we get ready to uh, receive the offering today, if, if you want to be a part of that, there's envelopes in the seat back, there's methods on the screen here in front of us that... Uh, uh, most of us don't carry checkbooks anymore, but pretty much all of us carry a phone. And so you can give online or via text message if you want to do that. And, and I'm going to pray for just a moment specifically about our finances. And, and can I just say, because some people get uncomfortable, you know, when, when we talk about money in the church. You know, people say, well, I don't, all the church wants is your money. That's not true. All Target wants is your money. Okay? They're in the retail business. We're in the kingdom business. We want way more than just your money. Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. <laughs> so our stakes are way higher than money. But we unapologetically talk about our finances because the Bible speaks very clearly about this. As believers, we understand that all of our life is a stewardship test. Not just your money, but also your time, your abilities, your relationships. Those things are all things that God has given us. And one day, we're going to all stand before God. And when we do, we'll stand alone. And we'll give an account for the deeds done in the body. We won't have to give an account for what we didn't have. Isn't that good news? So you don't have to look to your right or your left. God isn't comparing anyone's uh, sacrifice today. But for what he's given us, he asks us to be faithful with it. And that's why the Bible never talks about giving specific monetary amounts. Because that wouldn't be fair. Some of us have more, some of us have less. So God doesn't ask us for equal giving, but he does ask for equal sacrifice. And that's why the Bible speaks in terms of percentages. And one of the percentages that the Bible uses is the tithe. That's a, not just a Bible word, it's actually a math word. The translation of the word means 10%. So it doesn't matter if you have a lot or if you have a little, the tithe asks for equal sacrifice. And here's why we unapologetically talk about giving in our church because God wants to bless you he, he actually wants to 
He wants to bless your life. But God is not looking for containers of blessing. He's looking for conduits. He's looking for those that he can flow not just to, but through. And so we lift our hands open to God in worship, understanding that while my hands are open, God can pour blessing in them. But we also live with our hands open because God wants us to be generous people. And so we don't live life with clenched fists. We live with open hands, knowing that God's going to pour in as we're faithful to pour out. And so if you'll posture your life that way to say, God, I'll live open-handed, you can pray confidently, not arrogantly, but confidently, God, bless me. Because God told Abraham and all of his descendants, I have blessed you to be a blessing. So let's ask God for his blessing today as we pray. Lord, thank you so much that you're such a good God. Lord, you give us the things not only that we need, but God, you give us the desires of our heart when our hearts are aligned with your purpose. And so, God, we do want to live our lives with open hands. God, trusting that you're going to open up the windows of heaven and you're going to pour blessing out upon us. And knowing that, God, you're going to lead us by your spirit. You're going to position us, Lord, to do good, to be your ambassadors in the earth. So, Lord, let your blessing flow through this church like never before. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said amen. Amen. As we give today, watch these announcements. Hey, everyone. I'm Val. Welcome to Rightsville Assembly of God, and thanks for being here today. Before we get into the message, we want to give you a look at some upcoming events. On Saturday, July 13th, we're hosting an outreach in the park at Cool Creek Manor Apartments. We would love for you to come and join us as we serve lunch. Our desire for this event is to be a blessing to our community. You can find out more information in your bulletin. On Monday, July 1st and Tuesday, July 2nd, we're going to be decorating the church for Vacation Bible School. We would love to have you come and help us out as we transform our church for our African safari. And if you'd like to help us out by donating items for decoration, you can find a list of needed items at the Info Center. And if you're donating an item that you'd like to have returned, be sure to put your name on it before you drop it off. Vacation Bible School is coming up on Sunday, July 7th through Thursday, July 11th. This is the best week of the summer at Wrightsville Assembly of God. Kids four years old through those who have just completed the fifth grade will have a blast all week long learning that when life is wild, God is good. You can register your kids today at wrightsvillechurch.com and check out this video to see just how much fun your kids are going to have at VBS. Well, I'm so excited this morning to start a little mini-series for the next two weeks called When Pigs Fly. 
I don't know if you've ever faced things that seemed impossible before, but can I just declare to you this morning, that's the dimension that God shines in the brightest. He thrives in the area of impossibility because it's outside of his vocabulary. Amen? Anybody believe that this morning? I want to invite you today. Amen. I want to invite you today to open your Bibles with me to Luke's Gospel, chapter 5. This week and next week, I just want to stretch your faith. I want to encourage you to believe like never before in the God of impossibility. While you're turning there, let me just mention something. This is just a little pastoral announcement. Uh, This wasn't really planned ahead of time, but it's summertime and we just want to get together. So I want to just extend a a big invitation. Tonight, after dinner at 7 o'clock, a lot of us are going to meet at Jim Max for ice cream. If you've never been to Jim Max before, it's just straight out 462 towards Hellam. Just head west, out of town, and and you'll see it on the right. You can't miss it. If you want to be a part of that, you're invited. We're just going to go just hang out tonight. They've got ice cream and mini golf and arcades and basketball. You can do all of that or none of that. But we're going to go out there at 7 o'clock tonight. Want to invite you, invite your friends, family. Just come hang out with us. Beautiful weather outside. Isn't it? We have beautiful weather right now. So if you want to come, you're invited. Luke chapter 5. Are you there yet? All right. I want to ask you to do something with me. Could we stand one more time as we read the word? Luke chapter 5, beginning in verse 17. I want you to just let this story kind of get in your spirit. And then in a few moments, we're just going to walk back through it and ask the Holy Spirit to just illuminate our hearts. Beginning in verse 17. One day Jesus was teaching and Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. A paralyzed man on a mat, excuse me, some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, They went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew what they were thinking and he asked, Why are you thinking these things in your heart? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Immediately, he stood up in front of them took what he had been lying on, and he went home praising God. Verse 26. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe, and they said, We have seen remarkable things today. Before you're seated, could we just read that last verse together out loud? Maybe you have a different translation. It's up on the screen. Let's read verse 26. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, we have seen remarkable things today. Father, this morning, illuminate this scripture off the page. Lord, may it speak. May it penetrate our hearts. God, may it convict us of faithlessness. And may it stir us to believe for impossible things. God, thank you for your anointing today upon my lips as I communicate your word. God, give us ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said amen. 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 You can be seated again this morning. I want you to know verse 26, the one we're looking at here, this is my prayer. This is my prayer. It's been my prayer all this week as I've been praying about today and meditating on this text. My hope today and on any Sunday, by the way, is that we would see this be the reality. That when people come to this church, everyone would be amazed and give praise to God. Not because of the eloquence of one of the communicators, not because of the the strength of the coffee, come on somebody, 
not because of the music or the singing or, or any of that, but that we would all be amazed and praise God and that we would be filled with awe and that we would say, we have seen remarkable things today. That's my prayer for our church. Let me just go on record this morning and say right out of the gate here with this little series, nowhere in the Bible is it communicated that miracles cease with Jesus. I'm, I'm glad at least, you know, at least me and Pastor Chris are in agreement theologically on this point. Nowhere in the Bible is it communicated or even alluded to that miracles cease with the apostles. In fact, when Jesus was ascending back into heaven after his earthly ministry, Jesus gives what we call the Great Commission. And it's in a few places in Scripture. I, I want to show you one on the screen here. Out of Mark chapter 16, Jesus says to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. But whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands. And when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. Then he says this, they will place their hands on sick people and they will get well. Then it says this, after the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven and he sat at the right hand of God. Then the disciples went out, preached everywhere, and the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by the signs that accompanied. There's two things that Jesus is still doing that he did on that day. The Lord went with them. The Lord worked with them as they preached the word, and he confirmed his word through signs. That was the pattern of the New Testament church. And can I just say to you today, he's still working with us. Aren't you thankful that God's working with us? And he's still performing signs that accompany his work. Divine healing is one of our cardinal doctrines as a church. We have four theological beliefs that we call cardinal doctrines. Now, now there's a lot of different views on a lot of different things, even in our church. There's people that have different views, and, and that you know what? There's grace for that. There's room for that. God will straighten us out when we get to heaven. Amen? But we call these four cardinal because they, they're so catalyzing. They're so mobilizing. They drive the train of who we are as a church. And if you don't agree with these four things, you're still welcome here, but you're probably not going to want to make this your church. And one of those four things is that we believe in divine healing. Can you think of a Sunday that we didn't pray for the sick? And so if you don't believe God heals, you're going to check out at least at one point in every service. Why? Because we believe the God who was is the God who is and the God who will be. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And his power is at work in them that believe. Some of you are getting slow started. We should have made the coffee a little stronger this morning. Y'all are going to have to help me better than that. I preached last night at an Arabic church. It was so cool. Speaking of God helping us, man, I needed God's help last night. I prayed all week for the interpretation, but I didn't have that gift. I, I, I was like, this would be so cool if I could just, you know, speak in Arabic, but God didn't give me that gift, so I had to go with the interpreter. It was tough. Man, you know, I, I've preached in Guatemala and had translators, and Spanish just kind of flows with English pretty well, but it was tough. The Arabic and the English, I, it was like trying to do double dutch for the first time. Like, I didn't know when to start talking or when to stop talking, and it took us a while. We got into a flow, but it took us a while. But you know what? <laughs> through, through all of that, God worked. Last night, at the end of that message, I, I preached about the second coming of the Lord. I told people that, that Jesus is coming again, and that today is the day of salvation. That no man is guaranteed tomorrow. And that we have to choose Christ while the door is open. Last night, there was a gentleman that came to that service who was from Pakistan. He's Muslim, but he's seeking truth. And he came to that service last night. 
And at the end of the message, I gave the opportunity for people to come through the door of salvation. That is Jesus alone. And to put their faith in Christ. And last night, that Muslim brother raised his hand and he gave his life to Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? Praise God. He came down to the altar and he gave his heart to the Lord. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is moving on the hearts of people. And one of the ways that the Holy Spirit moves is through divine healing. I just want you to know it's a conviction of ours. We believe that He is in this place today. We structure our services in such a way that we anticipate holy interruption. I don't want you to interrupt me, but I'm okay with the Holy Spirit interrupting me. I want you to look with me at this story again as we walk through it. Verse 17 says, One day Jesus was teaching and Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. <laughs> they probably weren't saying amen either. They, I, I've, I've preached in that church before. They were, they were just sitting there. Religious folks. Not here, but I'm saying I've been in that church. It says they had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. Now can I just say this right here. We're framing this in our imagination. This is a picture of religion. Because all the people that feel like they have it all together and that know all the commands, all those people that don't think they really need Jesus' help but they'd like to hear his opinion, they're sitting close. They're in the room. But the people that know they need a miracle, the people that are desperate for a touch from Jesus' hand, they can't get in because of the crowd. They're on the outside. And isn't that what religion says to us? If you're good enough, you can get close. That's what religion says. If you're good enough, if you've figured it all out, you can be right up. You get a front row seat. You can be up close to the action. But if your life's a wreck, you don't have stuff together. There's no room for you in here. Well, that may have been the reality in that room that day, but can I tell you, that is not the heart of Jesus. Jesus said very clearly in one sentence what his whole mission was. Luke 19.10, he said, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. That's who he's interested in. He said in the Gospel of Mark, he said, it's not the healthy who need a physician. It's the sick. He came to bring healing to the sick. See, one of the biggest lies that the devil could ever convince us of is that you need to get your life in order to get close to Jesus. Like, just, just fix your stuff. Work out your problems. Get over your issues. Get everything in place. And then, then you'll be welcome to come in. That's a lie from the pit of hell. The reality is, if you could do that, if there was anything that you could do to straighten your life up, to get yourself in a place that you would be acceptable in Jesus' presence, I want to promise you, God would have let you do it. If you could have done it, He would have let you do it, but you couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. That's why God had to send His Son into the earth to be the perfect atonement, to be the spotless Lamb of God, sinless perfection, sacrifice for the sins of the world. That's God's plan of redemption. And if there was another plan, he would have taken it because any plan would have been easier than to give his own son's life. But he gave it. Why? Because you and I don't measure up. We see a person who doesn't measure up, who can't find a way in. And yet the Bible says in the latter part of verse 17, the power of the Lord was present for him to heal the sick. Now, here's what I find interesting about that. It almost infers that there are other times that the power of the Lord is not present for him to heal the sick. Other, why, why would Luke say that? Why would Luke, who, who's very detail-oriented, he's a doctor, he really gives us all, all the nuance and color of the miracles especially, because that was his area of expertise. And he takes his time to make sure we understand that in this moment, on this day, power was available for Jesus to heal the sick. And so it begs the question, and maybe you've asked it before, why doesn't God always heal? Maybe even this topic today makes you a little uncomfortable because you've prayed before and not seen God respond. Because you know good people, godly people, that have asked for a miracle and didn't get one. And so somewhere in your experience, you developed a theology that contradicts the Word of God. Because it better aligns with your reality. Why doesn't God heal? Well, i got to be honest with you. Sometimes the answer is, I don't know. 
Sometimes we won't understand until we have full revelation and when we see God face to face. Then it'll all make sense. But God doesn't leave us in the dark. We do have a few things that we can understand. In fact, I want to give you three. Three reasons that Jesus doesn't do a miracle. Number one, Jesus never does a miracle just to prove who he is. You ever done this to God before? God, if you'll just do this for me, I'll serve you the rest of my life. Right? God, if you'll get me out of this, I'll go anywhere. You can send me to the Congo. God, if you can just, or maybe when you were a kid, Lord, if you don't let my parents find out, I'll do anything. And we, we want to bargain with God. Listen, you can't, you can't twist the arm of the omnipotent, omnipotent Father to, to do what you want Him to do. And God, he, Jesus just doesn't, he doesn't play that game. So if, if your motivation for, for belief, if your bargaining chip for buying into faith is, if God, if you'll do this, then I will, don't. Because he won't. In fact, there was a time in Mark's gospel, chapter 8, it says in verse 11, the Pharisees came and they began to question Jesus. They tested him and they asked him for a sign from heaven. And it says, he sighed deeply. Like, ah, oh, just give us a sign. Prove it. Prove it. And Jesus groans. Ugh, oh, these people. And he says, why does this generation ask for a sign? Truly, I tell you, no sign will be given to it. So Jesus isn't going to do a miracle just, just to prove to you who he is, because that's not faith. God responds to faith, and faith is the requirement for our belief and for our salvation. And so if we're holding out and saying, God, manifest something, show me something, and then I'll believe. God's looking for faith. Secondly, Jesus will not do a miracle if it interferes with the ultimate plan of God. God, God has a sovereign plan, and, and admittedly, it's bigger than our thought. I don't always understand God's plan. There are plenty of times where I look at situations and, and I just scratch my head and I wonder, say, God, I don't know what you're doing here, but I do know you have a plan. And I do know his plan is ultimately for our good. Maybe not always temporarily for our good, but ultimately his plan is for our good. And I'll show you a place in scripture where, where we see Jesus having the power and ability to do a miracle, and he actually does a miracle, but in that same scene, he chooses not to do another miracle because it goes against the will of God. Jesus will never do a miracle that goes against the sovereign will of God. He's not going to intervene miraculously when God has a bigger plan. So when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane on the night of his betrayal, and Judas comes out of the shadows and he kisses him on the cheek and, and swords and torches are flashing and, and they come to arrest Jesus. Peter, one of the disciples, he steps up with a sword and he takes a swing at the soldier. And the Bible says he cuts off the ear of one of the high priest's servants, Malchus. And so here they are in the dark of night and Jesus stops him. He says, wait, wait, put your swords away. And he starts looking around and he finds the ear and he picks up the ear and he puts it back on Malchus's head. He heals him. In that moment, Jesus had the power to do miracles. But in that moment, the very next thing he does is he says this in Matthew 26. He says, do you think that I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels. But how then would the scripture be fulfilled that say it must happen this way? Jesus was saying, look, if, if I wanted to do a miracle right now, I could, I could do a miracle. I could wipe all these guys out. In fact, do you remember the story when they first came to arrest Jesus? He said, whom do you seek? And his words had so much authority, the Bible says they all fell down. So I guess it was after they got up that Peter cut somebody's ear off, or maybe he cut it while he was down. That's kind of Peter's, you know, he probably did that. Jesus said, I could do the miracle. I, I could call in heaven's armies. But that's not God's plan. 
And for some of us, we don't know why God won't intervene. We don't know why God won't bring the healing. We don't know why God won't answer the prayer. And maybe we'll never know. But the reality is Jesus is not going to interfere with the sovereign will of God. And sometimes God has a plan that is greater than what we can see in the here and now. Let me tell you the third reason. Sometimes Jesus just doesn't do miracles. He never does miracles where there is no faith. There's no faith. He's not going to do a miracle. In Mark chapter 5 and going into chapter 6, Jesus just, one, Mark records one miracle after another. He's doing incredible, incredible things. He goes out and he delivers a man who's possessed by demons. The guy, the guy was so uncontrollable that they would actually bind him with chains and he would break the chains and rip his clothes off and run through the wilderness naked. He was crazy, and nobody could do anything. Jesus took a boat all the way across the shore, went over, and delivered the man of demons. Then he came back. And then he, he's on his way to minister to somebody, and a woman who had an issue of blood for 12 years reaches out and touches the hem of his garment. Jesus didn't even pray for her. He didn't even say he wanted to heal her. But faith was in her when she touched him, and power went out of him and healed her. And then after that miracle... He proceeds to go to the house of a man named Jairus, whose daughter was lying dead. And this 12-year-old girl was brought back to life. Jesus is doing supernatural miracles. And then it says from there, going into Mark 6, it says Jesus went to his hometown. So Jesus goes back to his hometown of Nazareth. Well, he's doing all these incredible miracles. And when he comes into town, the Bible says the people looked at him and said, Isn't that the carpenter? Like, didn't, didn't he go to school down the street? Isn't that his brothers over there? Isn't he the son of Mary? And the Bible says that in that moment, the people were offended at him. They took offense at Jesus. This isn't, this isn't some special prophet. This is, this is Jesus. He's the carpenter. We know where his shop is down the road. And the Bible says in that moment, in Matthew chapter 6, in verse 6, it says Jesus was amazed at their lack of faith. There's only one thing in Scripture that the Bible says amazed Jesus. It was faith. When he saw a lack of faith in his hometown, it amazed him. The other place happened when a Roman centurion came to him and said, Jesus, my servant is sick. And Jesus said, I'll come. And he said, no, 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 you, you don't have to come. I mean, I'm a man of authority. I, I get it. I say to this one, go, and he goes. I say to this one, do this, and he does it. I'm a man under authority. Just say the word, and I know my servant will be healed. And Jesus said, whoa, did you hear that? And he turned to the crowd of people he was teaching, and he said, this man has more faith than everyone in Israel. Jesus was amazed at his faith. And, and I just want to say to us this morning, Jesus is amazed. Now, I don't know how you're amazing him. If you're amazing him because of the incredible faith you have or if he's amazed at your lack of it. But Jesus is amazed by faith. And if there's no faith, there's no miracle. And we ought to pay attention to a story like that because it tells us something that's so very important. It tells us that faith matters. I, I don't have miracle working power. It's not in me. It's not in you either. It's in Jesus. But Jesus responds to faith. So we have to have faith to believe. Look at verse 18 with me. It says, some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat, and they tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. Now, this verse shows us something we can all relate to. A failed attempt. You ever tried to bring somebody to Jesus? And it didn't work? Ever tried to invite somebody to church and they shut you down? Ever tried to start a spiritual conversation with somebody and then they threw out some question you couldn't answer and you sheepishly walked away? You're like, oh, well, have a good day. You kind of backed out of that deal? Changed the subject? These guys had good intentions. They wanted to bring their friend to Jesus. They knew who had the power and they knew who needed it, but they failed. I'm going to tell you, this man who's lying on this mat paralyzed is a person that on the outside we would look at and we would pity him. 
because of his condition. We would feel sorry for him. But I want to tell you this morning, this guy's blessed. And he's blessed because he has a friend that cares enough about him to try to get him to Jesus. Not just one friend either. He's got four friends that care enough about him to try to get him to Jesus. I I don't know if you've got friends like that. But this guy is a blessed man because somebody is willing to make the effort to try to get him to Jesus. And so they they gave it their best, and it didn't work. And and they could have said, you know what? We tried, guys. We tried. Let's just take him back down to his corner where he sits and put him in front of his little tin can and hope some more people bring him some alms. No. No. One of them, and I don't know who it was, but one of them got a crazy idea. When they couldn't get in the front door because the house was so packed, one of them said, hey, what if we just climb a ladder and get on the roof? And and what if we just go to the back of the house where Jesus is, and we just tear the roof off, and we'll just shove him down through the hole, and we'll lower him down on his mat right to where Jesus is. Now, I don't know if that was the first idea. I'm, I'm thinking, I mean, if I'm there, probably got a few other ideas before that one. Like, you know, maybe, maybe they tried a window first. Maybe there was a back door to the house. I don't know how they came to this conclusion. Maybe this guy was just really motivated and just kind of dominated the conversation. I don't know. But one of them came up with this crazy idea and said, you know what? Let's get on the roof. Let's tear a hole in the roof and let's get him to Jesus. Look at verse 19. When they could not find a way, we don't know how many ways they tried, but when they couldn't find a way to do it because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and they lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. I got to tell you, that's determination. That's determination right there. A person that says, I am willing to tear the roof off if that's what it takes. For me to get my friend to Jesus. And I'll tell you, it's more than determination, it's commitment. Because I, I'm sure somewhere in the process, maybe it was trying to lug him up the, the, the ladder. Maybe it was when they started tearing the roof back. But, but somewhere in the process, it had to dawn on somebody that we're going to have to fix this. Like you, you don't just rip somebody's roof off. Like it's going to cost some money. I'm about to give up a weekend. I'm about to fix this thing. I'm about to pay for this. And that's what determination says. That's a picture of what the church ought to be like. The church ought to say, I will do anything by all means necessary at any cost if it means getting somebody that doesn't know Jesus into his presence. I'll tear the roof off. I'll pay for it. We'll fix it later. But let's do whatever it takes to get him to Jesus. This man had some people in his life that cared enough to be determined and committed. Can I just say to you today, you're free to fail. Not every effort's going to be successful. It's, it's okay to have the conversation and it not go right. It's okay to, to give the invitation and be rejected. It's okay to, to, to try to explain your faith and, and, and to run out of words and, and feel inadequate of, to have somebody out talk you. What's not okay is to stand outside and to make excuses for apathy. What's not okay for us is to just believe that, well, there'll be another day and there'll be another opportunity. See, these men, they had a Here's what they know. Jesus, the miracle worker, is in the house. Don't know when he got into town. I don't know how long he's staying. But today, he's in the house. This is the opportunity. Today's the day. We've got to figure this out, guys. I'm sorry that, that plan didn't work. Your plan didn't work. Your pl- okay, let's go to plan C. What if we just cut a hole in the roof? What if we just rip it apart with our hands and, and, and just start lowering them down in there? See, the problem for us is we've lived our whole lives with Jesus in the house. He's always here. And so we've lost the urgency. And if it doesn't work out today, eh, maybe next week. Maybe next time. Maybe, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll give it 
a few weeks so they kind of forgot about that awkward conversation, and I'll bring it up again. And we've lost the urgency. See, that's why one of our other cord, uh, cardinal doctrines as a church is the second coming of the Lord. One of our foundational beliefs is that Jesus is coming again. Now, now there's a lot of different views about eschatology and the study of end times and, and, and the order of how all that plays out. And God will straighten us out in the end. We'll all be on the same page eventually, I promise. But what we have to believe is what Jesus said. I'm coming soon. We have to live with the expectation that no man knows the day or the hour that Jesus could come back today. We can't live with the, the apathy that says Jesus is always in the house. I mean, maybe it's crowded today, maybe it's inconvenient today, maybe there's not a way today, but there'll be another chance, there'll be another time. See, the last thing that Jesus said when he uh, left the earth was, I'll be with you always, but the first message that came back from heaven was two angels that stood in white, and they said, why do you stand here gazing into the sky? This same Jesus who ascended will come back in like manner. In other words, get busy, guys. Quit standing here watching the clouds. Get busy because he's coming back again. And that urgency, that urgency would not allow them to take no for an answer. That urgency that this could be the last time Jesus comes into this village. This could be the last chance our friend has to experience his miracle working power. We've got to get him in the house. We've got to figure this out. Look at verse 20 with me. It says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. I love that it says when Jesus saw their faith. See, the paralyzed guy had faith. We know that because Jesus said your sins are forgiven. And nobody can be saved because of somebody else's faith. Doesn't matter how much they pray for you. Doesn't matter how much your mama wants you to be saved or your grandma, you can't be saved by somebody else's faith. You have to put faith in Jesus to be saved. So we know the paralyzed guy had faith, but, but Luke doesn't emphasize that. Luke says, Jesus saw their faith. And their faith included those four guys that were on the roof. And I love that, because it communicates to us that, that for good or bad, your faith and my faith, it affects other people. For good or bad. There, there's an impact that your faith has on others. This paralyzed man had some friends who wanted him to experience the power of God. And they had the faith to do something radical. To, to go outside of standard protocol and to say we're going to do something extravagant, something extreme. If it means getting our friend to Jesus. There's something powerful about having friends that are committed to you getting close to Jesus. Maybe, maybe we should just ponder that thought for a minute. How many of your friends are actually committed to you getting closer to Jesus? Now, it's great to have friends. It's great to have people you can hang out with, shoot the breeze with, watch the game with. Oh, that's great. All kinds of, I mean, Jesus was a friend of sinners. I'm not saying all your friends should be sanctified and filled with the Holy Spirit. But do you have friends that are committed to you getting closer to Jesus? Because this paralyzed man, though outwardly he was to be pitied, he was a blessed man. He was a blessed man. You know, this week, tomorrow actually, our students, many of them are heading to youth camp. And... Some of them are going for the first time, and they have no idea what they're about to get into. It's going to be awesome. I, I've seen it happen over and over dozens of times. Here's what's going to happen. They're going to get into that atmosphere at camp this week, and God is going to absolutely rock their world. They're going to experience the presence of Jesus maybe like never before. And some of them, they don't, they don't know it, so they don't have the expectations for it. They're just looking forward to a great week of camp. But here's why it happens. Because when they get on that campus, when they get on that campground, all of a sudden, they're surrounded by friends that are committed to getting closer to the heart of Jesus. I mean, for the first time, maybe, 
They, they don't have the outward pull of, of culture. They don't have the, the, the draw away from Christ. All of a sudden, you're at a campground. Everybody knows, hey, this is church camp. I mean, we're supposed to seek God this week. And tomorrow night, the worship team from the University of Valley Forge, they're going to get on that stage, and they're going to begin to worship. It's going to be loud, and there's going to be this eruption of praise. And some of those students, unbeknownst to them, they're going to be picked up. Like somebody's come and grabbed all four corners of their mat. They're just going to be picked up and rushed right down to the altar and thrown right into the very presence of Jesus. And their life is going to be absolutely rocked. That's what it's like when you're surrounded by people that are committed to you getting close to the throne of God. In fact, let's do something. Let's just stop right now and let's pray for our students. Can we do that? Father God, I pray that this week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, God, that you would absolutely display your glory and power in the lives of our students. Lord, for those that are going to camp, Lord, we pray that they would feel a lifting, like they're being picked up on a heavenly blanket and just laid down at the feet of Jesus. Father, I pray that you would do miracles in their lives this week. Father, that some of our students would establish a relationship with you, that, that they would hear your call on their life, that they, would, uh, that they would respond to their God-given destiny this week. God, for those students that have some broken places in their life, some paralyzed places in their lives, some things that aren't functioning the way you intended them to, God, would you speak into their situation, raise them up off of their mat, And send them back home with a powerful testimony of your goodness and your glory. God, we just pray that you would just move powerfully. And Lord, let let them come back with something tangible on their lives that would have a ripple effect through this entire congregation. God, we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Continue to pray for our students this week as they get ready to go to camp. I want you to look with me at verse 21 quickly. It says this, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves. Who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Isn't this funny that the religious people were more concerned with arguing over theology than they were with being sympathetic towards the person in need? I mean, here's a man who's paralyzed. He's just been lowered down through the roof. In front of Jesus. And they're thinking about theological debate. You know, I'm convinced if Jesus would have just seen the man and just healed the man, they probably would have just looked at each other and said, yeah, he's been doing that a lot lately. Like, whatever. Jesus is healing people. It's kind of his thing. But no. Jesus had the audacity to say, son, your sins are forgiven. See, a religious religious spirit will blind you to the needs of other people. That's what a religious spirit does. It it gets all on the inside of us. And then instead of being more concerned with with the the spiritual and physical condition that people are in, we all of a sudden, we get so internalized that that we're concerned about if they say it right or if they do it right or, or things that are not even the main issue. But the next verse says, Jesus knew what they were thinking. That verse might make some of us nervous this morning. (laughs) He knew what they were thinking. And he asked, why are you thinking these things in your heart? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven? Or to say, get up and walk? Which, by the way, the answer is obviously, it's easier to say your sins are forgiven. If you come to the altar this morning... And tell me you need to be saved. And I pray with you. And you accept Jesus into your heart. Because of what I know in this book. I can say authoritatively. Your sins are forgiven. But if you roll somebody down here in a wheelchair. Who can't walk. And I pray for them. How many of you know it's going to take a lot more faith and courage on my part. To say get up and walk. That's what Jesus was pointing out. He was saying okay what's easier to say. And then he said this. Verse 24, but I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. 
So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Can I just say to us today, this is a powerful principle we need to always remember. Jesus responds to faith, but Jesus always sees the greatest need of your life. Jesus looked at this man, and he saw way more than what everybody else saw. I mean, it was pretty obvious what the guy needs. I mean, they're they're dropping him in on a mat. He can't move his arms and his legs. What do you think he needs, Jesus? But Jesus is looking at the greatest need of his life. See, earlier I asked a question. I said, why doesn't God always heal? And sometimes the answer is, it's not that God doesn't respond to faith. It's that we're looking for the wrong answer. It's that we're looking for God to do something outward, something that we can see and experience in, in, in the earthly realm and he's doing a deeper work god's answering a greater need in his life see jesus saw their faith and immediately he responded to it he said friend your sins are forgiven and in a moment that moment the greatest miracle that could ever happen happened in that moment just like last night at the end of that service when when i saw that muslim brother raise his hand and say i want to accept jesus There's no penance. There's no, you got to make retribution for all of your previous lifestyle. No, in that moment, that man and this man was translated out of darkness and into light. And according to the word of God, this guy may never walk the dusty streets of Galilee, but he has the assurance that he's going to stroll down the streets of gold. That's salvation. That's the greatest miracle that could ever happen. Let's be honest this morning. We don't fully grasp that. If we did, we'd get more excited about it. Now, if somebody's legs started growing or somebody's blind eyes opened, we'd freak out. This morning, we'd we'd be amazed. You'd you'd be posting it on Insta stories. You'd be going, look at this. Look what happened in church today. Five people could get saved, and you're thinking about lunch. Why? Because we, we, we can't comprehend fully, but Jesus He he didn't just grow up here. He stepped out of heaven and came to this earth. Jesus knows full well the reality of the miracle of salvation. And so in this moment, Jesus, it it seems like he doesn't even, he's not even really concerned with healing the guy's physical body. I mean, it it almost sounds a a little cold. Like Jesus, he's so thrilled that this guy is saved. He's so thrilled that those men had the faith to bring their friend to Jesus. And he said, son, your sins are forgiven. He's happy. He's not as consumed as we are with having some 70 or 80 years of a healthy life on the earth if it means it's going to end with an eternity in hell. He's not that concerned with the quality of this life when eternity's at stake. And so Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. And then he says, why, why are you guys thinking what you're thinking right now? I know, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking he's not really forgiven. He is forgiven. If, if you think I can't forgive him, watch this. And it seems like the only reason that Jesus heals the guy is, is to just confirm the fact that he's already done a greater miracle. That Jesus has saved this man's life. See, John, the apostle, got a little bit of a taste, just a little foresight, when he was on the Isle of Patmos in Revelation 21. God just pulled back the curtain and let him see a little bit of what will be. And in Revelation 21, he said, there, there will be no more weeping. There will be no more tears. There will be no more pain." In that day, the old order of things. There will be no more crying. It's all been passed away. Paul the apostle got a little glimpse of of the miracle of salvation. And he wrote to the church in 2 Corinthians. He said this. He said, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. And, And Paul, to say our light and momentary troubles was saying something. Because for Paul... Those light and momentary troubles included being shipwrecked, floating adrift at sea, being flogged with a cat of nine tails, just like Jesus was at the whipping post. Paul experienced that five times. Paul was stoned and left for dead. Many theologians believe he actually did die, and after they drug him outside, God raised him up, and he went back in the city and preached again. 
Paul said, I've been hungry, I've been naked, I've been cold. And then he writes to the church when he thinks about heaven and he says, these are light and momentary afflictions. Because they're all going to be surpassed by a glory that far outweighs them all. See, I I don't know exactly what heaven's going to be like, but I know this. I know that when we get there, we're not going to worry about what we went through before we got there. We're not going to worry about the pain or the suffering or the experiences on our journey. The reality is God doesn't always heal when we want him to. God doesn't always heal how we want him to. But God responds to faith. He's a miracle working God. He's a miracle working God. Look at verse 25 again. It says, immediately, the man stood up in front of them, took what he had been laying on, and he went home praising God. Jesus proved he had power over sin by doing this miracle. And, And I love that it tells us he took what he had been lying on. In other words, the thing that he was bound by He's now walking out with as a testimony. I, I, I love that. that he, didn't, he didn't just leave the mat there. He didn't just forget about his old life. No, the thing that he was carried in on, the thing that he was bound by, now he's carrying it because it's a testimony. And that's what God can do in the atmosphere of faith. The thing that you're bound to, it might not be a mat you can't get up off of. It might be a ball and chain. It might be an addiction. It might be a a broken marriage. It might be a, a health condition. But whatever it is that keeps you bound, Jesus in a moment can raise you up and tuck it under your arm and send you out with a testimony. That's what God wants to do. That's why he wants to respond to faith. See, we, we get it twisted. We, we want to see miracles because we just like seeing cool stuff, right? I mean, some of us, we, we get excited when, when people get emotional. If, if somebody gets prayed for and they, they fall on the floor, we go, oh, man, would you see that? Somebody gets wound up and they start running around the building or dancing. We go, oh, man, that's cool. And we want the fanatical and people go chasing after guests special speakers and pack arenas and conferences and those are great if they feed your spirit but God's not responding to all that God's responding to faith and there's a purpose for it and it's not so that we can have a cool experience or an emotional feeling God wants to display his glory in our lives so that we can tuck that testimony up under our arm and go back out of the house and tell a lost and dying world we know a powerful God And this man got up and he took his testimony and he marched out of the house. Oh, there was room for him now. People were getting out of the way. Look at this guy. And and we're back to the last verse. Look at it again. Verse 26. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe. And they said, we have seen remarkable things Today, Don't you want that to be our testimony? I mean, don't you want to leave church not just saying like, oh, it was a good day at church today. Don't you want to leave filled with awe? Don't you want to leave amazed? Saying we've seen remarkable things today. I want to take some time right here at the end of this service and we're going to pray. We're going to pray for miracles. We're going to pray for the impossible. And so I I just want to ask you to be honest with me right now. If you're here this morning and you say, I I need a miracle in my life. I need need God to bring healing in my life. Would would you just let me know? Just raise your hand. I'm not going to have you speak or anything. I just want to know where you're at. Just raise your hand. Yeah, a few. One, two, three, four. Anyone else? Just raise five, six. I I need a miracle. I need a miracle. We're going to pray. For you. Let me just challenge all of us here for a moment to just expand your faith a little bit. God doesn't just operate in the realms of spiritual and physical healing. Some of you, you, you didn't raise your hand because you're like, I'm, I'm good. Like, I'm good. But your marriage is a wreck. Or your kids are running from God, 
or your finances are destroying your life. God is not limited. God can work in all of those areas today. And and maybe, if I can just stretch you a, a little more here today, maybe the miracle that you need isn't for you. Some of you need to be like those four friends. They had enough determination to say, no, 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 we need a miracle and we need it today. We're not taking no for an answer. Some of you need to take up one of the four corners for somebody else today. See, this story is a beautiful picture of intercession. Intercession is when we pray on somebody else's behalf. And when you when you pray on somebody else's behalf, it's like you've picked up your corner of the mat and you ascend that stairway in prayer so that you can lower them down by faith to the very feet of Jesus, where he can move in their life, where they can be forever changed. And some of you, you need, you need a miracle for somebody else. And you need to stand today in proxy for them and believe Jesus can touch them and change their life. So I'm going to ask again, who needs a miracle today? Come on, would you raise your hand? All all over this room, let me just say, that's a good place to be. It's a good place to be when you come to the reality that I am totally dependent on God. Some of of you, you, you're not raising your hand because you're like, I I might need a checkup. I don't know if I need a miracle. I mean, might want to get some things looked at, you know, but... But can I just tell you, God works in a multitude of ways. I, I spoke for a couple. Uh, I spoke to a couple people after the first service this morning that are going in. One's going in for surgery this week. The other's got an appointment tomorrow with a doctor to get the results of a biopsy. Listen, if God prompts you to go get a checkup you've been putting off, and the doctor find something and removes it and you're healthy, I'm going to give God praise for that. How about you? If God gives you wisdom about some of the effects you've been dealing with and and you talk to your doctor and and he adjusts your medication and all of a sudden everything's good again, I'm going to give God praise for that wisdom. See, faith is not a, a, a lack of wisdom. It's foolish to say I'm not going to the doctor because I'm going to trust God. God gave you wisdom. God can move in a multitude of ways. But he always moves in response to faith. So I want to ask you, let's stand together all over this room. We're going to pray a prayer of faith. Would you just lift a hand or or maybe even both hands towards heaven as just a sign of surrender to the Lord? We, re- we reach up, but we don't reach far, do we? Come on, this reminds us that if, this is, if it's up to us, God, we can't, we can't get past the ceiling this morning. But Lord, we're reaching up in recognition that you and you alone have the power and the authority and the ability to change our circumstances. God, we're calling upon you today to work miracles in our hearts and in our lives. God, we're asking you today to intervene supernaturally. God, would you... Would you change the circumstances? Would you bring healing today? Lord, for those that are struggling emotionally, God, Lord, give peace. Give soundness of mind. Give clarity of thought. Lord, for those who are are in a a situation relationally that just seems impossible, that there's no way to, to bring reconciliation, there's no way to put the pieces of the shattered relationship back together. Lord, you are the restorer of broken walls and lives. And so, God, would you put the pieces back together today? Lord, soften hardened hearts. Lord, restore, heal. God, for those that are needing you to to give them wisdom, Lord, in the area of their finances. God, we pray for supernatural wisdom. Give direction. Give provision, God. Lord, we trust you. You're the God of miracles. Nothing is too difficult for you. So we trust you today. And we come to you. And we lay our needs down at your feet.
God, for those who are standing today in proxy for someone else. God, we lower them down into your very presence with our intercession. God, we bring them before you. God, we need your Holy Spirit to move wherever they're at right now. Prayer knows no bounds. It knows no limitations. God, go to where they are in this moment. Begin to work. Lord, just like that centurion who said, you don't need to come, just speak the word, and I know they'll be healed. God, we speak your word today. You sent forth your word, and you healed diseases. God, do it again today. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I want to ask you to do one more thing with me before we dismiss. The first time I asked, several of you raised your hand. And maybe some of you should have, but if you need a miracle in your life, maybe a physical healing, I want to honor that faith. You just said, that's me. I need God to do a miracle in my life. Would you raise your hand one more time? Just so, just so I know who that was. Several of you prayed. Now, here's what I want us to do. I'm not going to ask anybody to come to the altar right now. But I'm going to ask you to put your hand up again. And if you're close to somebody with their hand up, I just want you to put a hand on their shoulder. Gather, we're going to pray over you. There's something about the power of agreement. We're going to take up all four corners here. So I want to invite you right now. You can move from where you're at. Go to somebody whose hand is up. And let's just pray. We're going to just pray the prayer of faith. You don't have to... You don't have to hear their story. You don't have to know what they're facing. I just want to come in agreement right now. Yeah, I need some more people to move. There's still some people that need a miracle. That Their hand is up. Anyone else? You need someone to pray with you. I'm looking for anyone else. Amen. Come on, let's just take a moment right now and let's ask God to move. Father, thank you right now for the faith to believe for miracles. God, we pray right now that you would just move in this sanctuary, by your Holy Spirit. Your word declares, Lord Jesus, that you went about healing all who were sick with diseases and oppressed of the devil. Father, we pray right now that you would move throughout this room. Lord, even through our hands, as we lay hands on our brothers and sisters in Christ, right now, God, bring your healing power. Come on, let's lift your voice together. Lift your voice in faith. God, we believe today for your healing. We believe for your miracle working power. God, we we refuse to just sit outside of your presence and wait for another time. God, today, we're going to find our way in. We're going to press in through prayer. We're going to get to Jesus today. Father, move on behalf of your people. We're asking for healing. We're asking for miracles. Lord, may we leave this place amazed God, may we leave this place today saying we have seen a remarkable thing. Lord, would you demonstrate your glory in Jesus' name. Father, I pray for everyone here who you've already delivered, those that you've set free from bondage, from addiction, from sickness. God, I I pray against a, a spirit of pride that would want to keep our mat tucked away in a closet. God, you set us free so that we could glorify you. And so, Lord, I pray that when we leave this place today, Lord, we would leave this place with a testimony tucked under our arm. That, Lord, we would leave this place with a determination to give you glory for great things you have done. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so this week. Father, I pray that you would inspire us to testify about your goodness in our lives. Thank you that you saved us, that you set us free, that every one of us, at one time in our lives, we were paralyzed and lying flat on our mat spiritually. We had no life in us till Christ came and set us free. So Jesus, compel us this week to carry a testimony into a world who desperately needs a powerful Savior. And we thank you for it. We give you praise in Jesus' name. And all God's people said amen today. Amen. Come on, let's give God praise this morning. Amen.